we don't expand our imagination. And welcome once again to Washington Unplugged. Bob Schieffer here. Well, after months and months of struggle, the winner this week seems to be President Obama. He signed the health care reform bill that he promised in the campaign, signed it into law. He tacked on student loans, a major deal. And there is a jobs bill that he's been working on. He also, uh, we are now finding out, has apparently successfully negotiated an arms reduction treaty uh, with Russia. Mark Ambender and Politico's uh, Eamon Javers uh, are here to talk about that. Also, the star of Heroes, Greg Grunberg, was at the Bureau to talk to Kaylee Hartung about epilepsy research. And finally, authors Naomi Khan and June Carbone are here to explain their fascinating study on family structures in the politically blue and red states. All that ahead, but first, let's start with our political uh, roundtable. Uh, Eamon is at political headquarters, and uh, uh, Mark is here with us at the desk. This happened to me one time where Walter Cronkite forgot my name. It was the longest 30 it's a seconds well, in so my... Well, so much has uh, happened this week that, you know... I'm, I'm having trouble getting it all together here, Mark. I apologize. This was uh, almost a term yeah. uh, for Barack Obama in about two weeks here. I mean, it, uh, it, it, and, and the primary effect of it, I think, is that it really re-energized the Democratic Party, which is... Uh, uh, which is, if you think about the past 14 months, a task that would have seemed Herculean, and yet in one week, you've gone from having a demoralized Democratic Party to a party that now has a, a, accomplishments to run on in the fall and enthusiasm. Uh, I don't know if this entirely changes uh, the, you know, the complexion of the midterms because a lot of perceptions are, are, are hardened and are set pretty early, but. I think we're looking at a new political environment this week. Well, you know, it's interesting because, uh, Eamon, I don't want to get your take on this. Yeah. Uh, to hear the Republicans tell it, uh, the fact that uh, uh, President Obama prevailed this week may be the worst thing that ever happened to him because they're saying uh, that it is going to have such ramifications uh, in November that it could cost uh, uh, Democrats the House and Senate. What's your take? Do you think yeah. uh, that that is actually possible? You know, Republicans were a lot more confident about that before the health care vote than they are now after it. You, you do get the sense that Republicans are a little bit skittish now saying, hey, wait a second, did, did we do the right thing here uh, politically? Because there was an expectation that Democrats would really take a beating on the health care vote. But since the vote has been taken, we've seen the poll numbers move in the president's direction. He's gotten a real balance politically out of this week and he's gotten momentum on things he wants to do elsewhere including Wall Street reform all of a sudden Republicans abandoned their amendments to that in committee and that thing is moving on a, on a grease track right now in Congress as well so the president suddenly holds the upper hand after uh, two months or more where he was really looking very very weak well uh, one thing that has diminished though is the noise level we're seeing uh, these uh, so-called tea party folk and uh, some people on the right who are saying we will never let this die we actually had incidents of vandalism at some uh, members of congress's offices uh, these people are vowing to uh, have uh, town meetings of their own now that the congress is back in their home state uh, what do you what do you see as the impact of that, Eamon? Do you think that's to be taken seriously, or will it just play itself out? No, I think it does have to be taken very, very seriously. I mean, we live in a, an extremely divided country politically right now and an extremely emotional country uh, right now. And on, on both sides, you see this uh, level of anger and frustration uh, that we haven't really seen in recent years. Uh, and it's a little bit scary and creepy to see some of these incidents happen uh, around the country in the wake of the health care vote. And I think that uh, folks in Washington have to pay a very close attention to that. Uh, and I think that law enforcement has to pay close attention to that to find out where this is coming from and whether it uh, poses a threat for us escalation or not. We, well, we should say for the record that uh, Republican leaders in both the House and Senate have denounced uh, right, violence right. and That's said right. this is not, not the way to go. But you're also seeing, uh, Mark, some Republicans say that Democrats are shamelessly trying to exploit this and use it to their own advantage. Well, you know, uh, and, and they, have a, they have a point, uh, because what Democrats want to do is cast the entire Republican Party as being representative of the extremes of the Tea Party movement, because they know 
that Republicans, in order to take back the House and perhaps the Senate, need a lot of Republican-leaning independents to vote for them. And Republican-leaning independents are turned off by the Tea Partiers. So the more the Democrats make noise about the Tea Partiers, the, in theory, the better it is for the Democratic Party. But boy, if you think the noise level is high now, wait until we start debating immigration. I just have yeah. a feeling that what we see now as, as, ex as extreme and poisonous is going to pale in comparison to what we, what we see when, when, when that debate starts later in this when year. Do, you, yeah. do either of you have any fix on when we're going to see that debate? You know, I, I think um, the, I, 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 I've, been, I've been asking this and it's a moving target, but my sense is that what the, ideally Democrats want to have the debate at, at, at a time when they can, because you can, probably can't get something passed before November, but they want to have a debate that, that um, allows for the Tea Partiers and Republicans to have this massive spasm of, of reaction and, and energize and, and make more enthusiastic Latino voters as well and not figure out a way not to turn off uh, the Democratic-leaning independents who need to vote it's as well. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking at some point in the summer is probably when we're looking at it, but but uh, I mean, you can you know you can correct me if I'm wrong. I just I think they're trying to figure it out right now. In part because, as he said, the the wheels the track is grease now, and a lot of things, cybersecurity, financial reform that we're taking a lot longer time are gonna are gonna push through a lot more quickly. So the Senate and the House are gonna have more time to play with. I think. Uh, yeah, question, Eamon, I would say that uh, while there's going to be a spirited debate on immigration reform, uh, my bet at this point would simply be that there will be a lot of noise, but in the end they won't get immigration reform I think, uh, this week. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I think there's no way they get it done this year. It's simply too big and too massive. Uh, and Mark is right. I mean, the, the emotion on that is going to trump what we saw with health care, and that was already pretty extreme. Uh, the question for Democrats now is whether they want to pick a fight on immigration this year before the election, or, or they don't want to pick a fight, because they're clearly not going to get a bill before the election. So uh, I could see the White House deciding, you know what, we're going to hold off on that. They have been holding meetings over at the White House on this issue uh, to sort of get things lined up, but they might hold off on making a big push because they don't want to open that can of worms before the election, particularly now that things look like they're really improving uh, uh, for Democrats. What they want to do is focus on jobs. With unemployment at 10 percent or nearly 10 percent, they need to show between now and November they're doing everything they can to put Americans back to work. Doing immigration at a time when they're trying to focus on jobs, it might not send the right message that they're looking to send ahead of the election. That's, I, I would certainly agree with that. Well, I'm going to thank both of you very much for those insights today. Turning to something entirely different now, uh, our next interview uh, has been a familiar face to television watchers, and now the star of TV's Heroes has been making the rounds here in Washington to talk about a cause very close to his heart, epilepsy. Our Kaylee Hartung met up with him to get the story. Here it is. Thanks. And thanks, Greg, for joining us today. Thank you. It's, uh, I mean, to, thank you for letting me talk about this. Because normally <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about heroes and the show and all that stuff. But this is, to talk about epilepsy, it's near, near and dear to my heart, my wife's heart. Um, our oldest son, Jake, has epilepsy. So to be able to get the word out and talk about it like this is really important. So tell me what your expectations are for the walk this weekend. Um, you know what? For us, I chair this walk. I've, I've chaired it every year. And it's just, it's empowering. In the same way that I started a website called talkaboutit.org, this community needs to know that they're not alone. And we're talking about epilepsy. And epilepsy is any, anybody that's dealing with a seizure condition. And our son Jake got it when he was seven. He started having seizures. He's 13 now. We've gone through you know, everything from, from uh, you know, surgery to a, a nerve stimulator that he wears to um, you know, and all the treatments. But one, the one thing that, that we have been privy to is to know that there are other people out there that are going through this. And we're not alone. And there are treatments and there are medications that can help. So don't settle if you're having a seizure. Don't, you know, uh, and, and don't freak out if you see someone have a seizure. When we come together at the walk, yes, it, it is to raise money, it's to raise awareness, but everyone's there, everyone there is like-minded. And we're talking about tens of thousands of people that come out on the mall in DC, this is huge. And yes, the cherry blossoms are beautiful, <laughs> but it's all about epilepsy and awareness. And to know that, you know, if you see an epileptologist, a specialist, if you, you know, search out the right medication and the right treatment, you can get as close as you want, hopefully, to seizure freedom. And that's, 
that's the message that I'm trying to send. And this weekend, aside from the good weather we're hoping to have, um, this is really an interesting time to be in Washington with health care reform wrapping up yeah. and for you to raise awareness for epilepsy. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a good time to piggyback on all the excitement and everything that's happening here. And this is a health-related issue. Um, and, and, you know, uh, epilepsy is, is one of those things that's had a stigma attached to it for so long. If you had epilepsy 50 years ago, you didn't talk about it. You didn't mention it. I guarantee there are people in here somebody has epilepsy and they may not want to talk about it. That's their prerogative. I get it. It's scary. But the more we open and, and break down those barriers and remove the stigma, the more we can, the closer we can come to finding a cure and getting the word out that there are great treatments, uh, you know, available. So. And while you're in Washington, you're going to visit Capitol Hill, the White House. Yes. Tell me who you're talking to and how you feel like members of, uh, of Congress and the administration are rallying behind your cause. It's been incredible. Um, I have to say, you know, I, I've never spoken to Congress before and we have a congressional hearing and we're speaking to Congressman Waxman and, and others and, and Perlmutter and, and uh, you know, it's these people that are actually, they, they actually care about uh, getting, my message is the awareness. So there already are awareness campaigns in the epilepsy community and they're already funding programs where you'll see a commercial occasionally that talks about epilepsy, but really to get that dialogue going, um, I'm out here with Jason Snelling, you know, from the Falcons and Alan Fanica. These are professional football players that have epilepsy. When you see that, you're like, wait a minute, it's not so scary, you know? And, and not that, you know, when, the, when our son asks, can I play football? We're like, wait, hold it. <laughs> That's no, no, not no. what we meant. Exactly. Don't take it too far. But it, it's, it's, again, it's getting the conversation going. That's what talkaboutit.org is about. Uh, the Epilepsy Foundation of America has been incredible, but everyone here in D.C. has been amazing in getting this message out. It's so needed. Absolutely. And you got a tour of the White House, I hear. Yeah, we took a tour of the White House, which was just incredible. My, my in-laws are with us, so I scored points with them. Nice. You know, we got a little tour. It's just an, it's such an amazing place, and um, it's the second time that I've actually toured. And, and the Secret Service, uh, there was, you know, they, they gave us a little kind of special peek into a couple rooms. You know, you, you see what everybody else sees, but it is... It's just an amazing place. Jake broke his foot. This was a kind of a cool thing. Not that he broke his foot, but uh, Jake, <laughs> Jake broke his foot playing with his friends at school. It had nothing to do with, with epilepsy. Mm -hmm. But um, so we had to take an elevator from the you know, ground floor up to the second floor, and he took the president's elevator. Very cool. Yeah, because the elevator. That'll make a kid's day. Exactly. I was like, don't get used to this treatment, okay? You get home, you clean up your room. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's that kind of stuff that makes it a really special trip for us. And final question, I've got to ask you, you've got a band that I know some of the proceeds are going to epilepsy, but other than that, I mean, it's a, it sounds like it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we're the real deal. It's called Band From TV. People can go to bandfromtv.org. Every penny, all the proceeds that the band makes goes to the various charities, but it's, I'm on drums. I'll be playing drums, actually, on the, on the mall uh, at the oh, rally. Yeah? Um, but uh, I'm on drums. Hugh Laurie from House is on keyboards. James Denton from Desperate Housewives is on guitar. Bob Guinea. Uh, Scott Grimes from ER. We have all these great celebrities. They're all on shows. They all have uh, uh, passionate charities that they care about. And uh, we've raised over $2 million for charity over the last uh, three and a half years. So it's really exciting. Any gigs playing in D.C.? We are trying to get it together. We They want to come out and play the walk, but if the weather doesn't cooperate, it's outdoors. Suddenly I got Hugh Laurie all the way from L.A. to D.C. and he can't And the play. equipment. And the equipment and everything. So, yes, we are working on something. We want to play D.C. I went to the Caps game last night and I was like... And they won. It was the greatest game <laughs> ever. A shootout. A shootout. I mean, my kids were so spoiled last night. But, um, you know, this is a great town and, and we really do want to come out and play, you know, a proper place and raise some money here in D.C. And... You know, if I could just leave everybody with one thing is please, uh, you know, go to talkaboutit.org, go to the Epilepsy Foundation of America website. Don't be afraid to talk about this and seek out um, all the best treatments. See a specialist if you are dealing with this and know that you can reach seizure freedom or as close to it as possible if you get the right treatment. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining uh, us. Appreciate it, you. Greg. Back to you. And finally, we're here with the authors of a study of American families and what their political orientation and the region where they live might mean for their structure and their survival. Naomi Kahn and June Carbone wrote Red Families, Blue Families, and they are here to talk about it. The name of the book, Red Families versus Blue Families, Legal Polarization and the Creation of Culture. First, you two are lawyers, right? Yes, do you describe yes. yourself as liberals or conservatives or do you, does that figure into this? 
Well, you know, there used to be a time when we could be professors and try to get at where the law is going without having to fit into a box. Uh -huh. But um, I, you certainly couldn't call us conservatives in, in the modern era. Although my students <laughs> are very confused, and I get lots of student <laughs> teaching evaluations. She's too conservative. She's too liberal. She's too conservative. She's too liberal. So uh, you write this book, and basically what it is, you've gone in and, and studied divorce rates and a lot of different things in the so-called red states and the so-called blue states. What is the most surprising thing you found out? Well, the thing that, that really struck us is that blue families, your quintessential blue families, are living red family values. Uh, lower divorce rates, lower non-marital birth rates in those parts of the country that are most blue and in those families with college-educated women and their families that tended to have most embraced the sexual revolution. And, and when we say blue states, we mean those are the states that generally vote Democratic, would yes. be considered more liberal. Uh, exactly. And so what, were you surprised to find that? And why did it happen? <laughs> what, what were the factors here? We were surprised to find that because you expect people to live their values. Mm -hmm. And here we had blue families living the same values that red families are known for. So blue families do have later, later ages of ch having children, but lower ages of divorce and higher marriage rates. Did the blue families tend to marry later or earlier than red families? Blue families tend to marry later than red families. Blue families tend to marry once they are emotionally and financially ready to have children. So they tend to finish college before they actually get married. And, and what about the red families? Um, higher rates of teen pregnancy, marriage at younger ages, childbearing at younger ages. And how do they, these two uh, sets of uh, cultures, I guess it were, uh, how do they feel about uh, abortion rights? Uh, well, we think abortion is, is just uh, part of a calculated political strategy to change the subject. We want to change it back to contraception. Mm -hmm. If you say what is the biggest difference between a blue model and a red model of family, blue model is you don't get married, you don't have children until you're ready. That means you have to use contraception. Abortion is the fallback. In a red world, in that world of abstinence education, it is. There should be abstinence until marriage, marriage at a young age. Once you're married, children follow, you can deal with them. We'd like to make the point. It's not just contraception for teenagers, it's contraception for married couples. Having a child is an incredibly resp uh, responsibility, and you can't assume the fact you're married means you're prepared to take now, care of Now, what children. kind of data do you use to support your, your conclusions here? We use census data. The census has enormous amounts of information in all kinds of different areas of the country. We also use data that sociologists have gathered together. And the other thing we use is we looked at the laws. We're both law professors <laughs> and we're very, very comfortable in a legal environment. And we looked at how the laws were associated with these different family forms. And so the laws in blue states and the laws in red states tend to differ on some major hot button issues like abortion, like same-sex, recognition of same-sex relationships. What is the most likely uh, cause for divorce is the earlier you marry, the more likely you are to divorce? Is that, is that what you're... That's absolutely right. The earlier you marry, the more likely you are to divorce. Now, that doesn't mean that anybody who gets married before the age of 20 is going to get divorced, but statistically, it's much more likely the earlier you marry that you will get divorced. But it's new. It's teen marriage has always been a big risk factor for divorce. It used to be, you go back to 1980, between getting married at, let's say, 22, 28, not that much difference. Today, every increase in age correlates with lesser uh, likelihood of divorce into the late 30s. That's new. And that's the product of this new family system that we're calling blue. And what about stay-at-home moms versus working moms? What impact does that have on the divorce rate? The group with, uh, and again, this is new, the group right now with the highest rates of marital satisfaction and the lowest divorce rates are the group that are basically two career couples. They don't have any time to spend with each other, but conflict is way down. 
according to a new book by Paul Amato. Uh, they're doing really well, unless unless the wife is working 60 hours a week, then it's not so good. Um, the families that are really in trouble right now are fa traditional families where the wife is working full time and doesn't want to, but has to, because her husband isn't earning enough, she's the one with the medical insurance, etc. Um, you know, traditional couples who live traditional lives are pretty happy too. Young people with no money, they're divorce prone everywhere. All right. Well, it's very interesting, and I, I actually have not read this book, uh, but after talking to you, I think I'm going to. Thank you very much. It looks Thank like you. a valuable piece of research, and thanks for being with us. That's uh, it for you. Washington <laughs> Unplugged, and do not forget to tune in Sunday when I'll hear from Senator Jim DeMint, the conservative uh, from South Carolina, Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, and the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Tim Kaine. I'm Bob Schieffer. Have a great day. Expand our imagination. Just in case, being what you